Assalamu alaikum and welcome. welcome to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV. In tonight's live show, we'll be looking at hopefully something that's going to reach out to the wider audience, in particular women. She, sisters, aunts, academia, people from all sources and varieties of um, societies, as it were. The program tonight is looking at the image of women in Shia tradition. Now, I've grown up here in UK all my life, and there's been a notion, as it were, growing up here in the mosques, look, visiting Imam Bargas, centres, that at times we have token figures such as Fatima al-Zahra, her daughter also, Zainab al-Kubra, that these are at times token figures. We at times hear about their narrations, the crying, as it were, but there at times has been a stereotype that women cannot um, supersede men in knowledge, spiritually as well. Um, and as a result, tonight's programme is going to be looking at these notable figures. Are they... Is it really a mirage that women cannot progress if Islam, Islam claims to be dynamic, culture, culturally aware of all sources, that it claims not to have racism and prejudice? I mean, I mean... I mean, when I was growing up here, there was a, a huge degree of conservatism placed, segregation, women on one side, men on the other side. So in the, therefore, we'll be looking at the credence given, or a lack of credence given to women throughout the ages, from the Holy Athel Bayt to right down to the latter-day figures such as Shahida bint al-Huda, sister of mm -hmm. Ayatollah Barqa al-Sada, also being a Shaheed. And therefore, we'll be looking also at the changes involved. Is there a change for Reformation? Is there a change in terms of Ishtahad? What can we do? With me tonight, we also have our regular guest, Dr. Sayed Amar Nakshwani. Assalamu alaikum, Wa alaikum Dr. Alaikum assalam Sayyid. wa rahmatullah. Welcome to tonight's live show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure again, once again, having Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Tonight's show, hopefully, will reach out to the wider audience. I do uh, appreciate if you can call in. Uh, the telephone number for telephone um, calls is 0203 515 You can also WhatsApp your messages on 07939 917 163. Once again, 07939 917 163. Um, so I don't want anyone thinking, well, there's two blokes sitting here talking about something that's relation in relation to just women. Um, so please do voice your questions, your comments, um, and hopefully um, we can provide a fulfilling live discussion mm -hmm. and an analysis, as it were, in terms of what's required, uh, what's taken place over the ages, as it were, I say now. So um, perhaps um, you can perhaps talk about, first of all, um, as I mentioned briefly, I, and I'm sure many other brothers as well, and sisters as well, on mm. the other side, have grown up in the West, and I'm, I'm sure also in the East as well, witnessing, well, you go to a wedding, you go to the mosque, there's women on one side, men on the other side, there's no interaction. People from other communities, non-Muslim communities, as it were, say, well, you're a little bit backward. Mm. What's going on here? You re actually say that you have given is women rights first and foremost. Yeah. So we'll probably talk about that. Sure, sure. And then also we would probably talk about the notable figures mentioned in the Quran, i.e. female figures first, um, <coughs> and then take it through there, hopefully as a journey, um, in terms of what's required and what's going on. Sure, the, the title is an interesting title because instead of image of woman in Shia tradition, I think it should be images of woman right. in right. Shia tradition. Okay. There have been different phases as to the image of the 
woman within Shi'i tradition? Are we talking about a lady who is in some Shi'i tradition seen as being born from the fruits of heaven? Or are we talking about, for example, the daughter or the wife of a member of the Ali, for example, Alids or Ahl al-Bayt um, background? Or are we talking, for example, of scholars who have sought to serve the religion um, who were known women of their time? So you don't really have an image, rather you have images yes. which you have to consider. Right. Couple that along with a very important um, notion that has to be discussed, and that is how culture affects the way we perceive our gender responsibilities, and okay. sometimes not so much religion. Or how culture has a major role in the way that that tradition is formulated. Right. Remember, for a long time, Shiism was seen as being Middle Eastern centric. Yeah, you know, your, yeah. your, many of the greatest scholars um, are scholars from Iraq, scholars from Iran, scholars from Lebanon. Lebanon see, and yeah. there is a certain culture, therefore, that's associated with the way the scholar may write or may formulate a discussion concerning women. Okay. I remember Khalid Abu al-Fadl in one of his works mentioned something interesting which has stuck with me for a long time and that is there is no doubt that 1% of the way the law maker in that mm -hmm. particular society provides us with that law is affected by his upbringing or his background. Yeah. And so therefore even when it comes to women within Shia tradition I think there needs to be an appreciation that culture has an effect on tradition as well. No text okay. can be studied without the context. And no text emerges in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. The text certainly is emerging at a certain period in the way the woman is perceived. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, there are a number of images which we then begin to pick and choose which to take and which to reject. Right. Which suits us which doesn't or which doesn't which to place on the pulpits and which to never mention we may mention Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam to a certain point where she is more metaphysically understood mm -hmm. than as an exemplar for modern day society because that person who may be given the sermon, that's the Fatima he wants to present. Yeah. Because if he presents a Fatima who is outspoken, a Fatima who may be able to give, let's say, a lecture in front of the woman of her time and the men. And the men. And the men. Then that person, even from the pulpit, who's meant to be sincere with the knowledge that they're disseminating, may also be wary of what they want the community to progress in mm -hmm. rather than what could be established as paradigms in early Shiism. Right. And that's why what you have in the world today is this battle. A battle between a group that sometimes are labeled unfairly as feminists, yeah. to look at them negatively, yeah. Yeah. who are saying yeah. that, look, within the tradition, there is enough evidence for us to reformulate our understanding of the prophetic message okay. and maybe reanalyze some misogynistic or arrogant patriarchal male chauvinistic ways that we have allowed our culture to superimpose on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. our communities. Yeah. Now, th then they're fighting a group who are like, Anyone who's speaking for the reformulation of the rights of women must be part of the Western imperialist foreign policy movement to destroy Islam. I'm sure you've yeah, seen that. Absolutely, and therefore bad. And therefore bad. And so these two are now fighting each other. Because with these two, what you have is you've got one group of them who are like, listen, we're being sincere. There's Fatima. It's Mubahala. She's meeting Christians. Mm -hmm. It's a political event. Yes. So can we not therefore have women in our community in politics, 
and representing the religion of Islam. And then you've got the other side who may turn around to them and say, you people keep speaking out for these things. Yeah. This is typical of you people who grew up in the West. Ironically, it's not just people who grew up in the West. No, 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 not at all. I mean, it's there people are people who in the East as well. In the East, who have seen a lot more oppression, in my humble opinion, than those in the West when it comes yeah. to the rights of education yes. for a female within her tribal system. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a major battle happening now. Right. And remember, the image of Islam very much is related to the image of woman. What's the stereotypical image of an oppressed Muslim? Muslim woman. Muslim woman wearing hijab, being wearing in the kitchen. A hijab. It's always the children. Exactly, that's the stereotypical. Being a housewife. Correct. Yeah. Now, when that's the stereotypical image, therefore, the reanalysis of this image or our understanding of the position of the woman within tradition is fundamental to the way our religion is perceived. Yeah, of course. So and remember, we don't live in a world where the religions that were the most ancient religions, a, a number of their followers don't follow them the way they used to. No. So when they're looking at the way Islam discusses an issue, many are looking with a secular lens, a secular mindset, and therefore this makes this discussion even more sensitive. Right, yeah. right. But in terms of the, if we just start from Allah's book, the Holy Quran. What female figures come to light, as it were, um, you know, that A, women can also take examples from, but also B, men as well, that, you know, these are highly respected, highly regarded women mm. that are, and these messages, these verses the Holy Quran is reflecting isn't just for women. This is for the world at large. I think there has to be a new paradigm in the right. understanding of the way we approach the Holy Quran. Firstly, to be just to all creation, irrespective of whether it's male or female. Justice is our barometer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates us both with the ability, both with the same essence, same origin. And I think there's something problematic here right. for some because within tradition, when you see that Eve is created from the rib of Adam mm -hmm. or that Eve is the cause of, and this can be seen in, in, in even in Abrahamic religions, yeah. that Eve yeah. was the cause of the original sin was the cause of the fall from heaven. When you look in the Quran, God wants justice to be established. Wants us all to establish justice with one another. Reminds us that he's created us male and female, mm -hmm. different races, different tribes in order to get to know one, one another. another. And that the best amongst us in the eyes of God are the men. No. Okay. The best amongst us in the eyes of God are the women. No. The best amongst us in the eyes of God are the most God conscious Jesus. in their life. Inna akramakum andallahi atqaakum. The one who has the most consciousness of their Lord's presence in their life. Don't tell me they're a man or a woman. I created you male and female, different races, different tribes. In order that you get to know one another, the best amongst you is the one with the most taqwa. taqwa. Once we've established this, then you see certain verses in chapter 33 of the Quran where Allah says, the Muslim man, Muslim woman, Mu'min mm -hmm. man, Mu'min, believing man, believing mm -hmm. woman, fasting man, fasting woman. Always a reminder, they're both seeking these lofty goals. Then after that, you've got certain women who are discussed. But I don't think discussed even within Shia tradition with the depth that they deserve. Okay. You know, like the Queen of Sheba, for example. Mm -hmm. God mentions her. Why don't we mention her more? Yep, during the time of Hazrat Suleiman. Yeah, so, yep. Half the world is hers. Yeah. Half the world, Suleiman. Sure. She finds her way to the Lord mm -hmm. when she could easily rest on her laurels. Yeah. You know, she's enjoying the life that she's living. Everyone respects her. 
the men around her are virtually subservient to her, like they won't make a decision without her approving. And, and it's as if God's showing in that one particular story that here's a woman leading men, but remarkably composed. Because what then tends to happen in Shia tradition is women are equal to men, but you have to build a family only. Yeah. Women are equal to men, but you're all emotional, but your emotion is good because it helps with the babies. This is what, you know, you'll hear the, from, the, from the pulpits a lot. I'm yeah. sure you'll agree with me. This is the um, classic the default understanding. Default. Well. It's a precursor, as it were. Yeah, as yeah. in, and this is, I suppose, what many of our mothers were raised on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You were either raised on the fact that you're going to grow to your teenage years, you're going to have to get married, have kids, and that's your role and emotionally because you're not stable that means that we can't really put you in positions of at the helm i suppose as you mentioned say now women who have knowledge are seen as being dangerous yes to many communities i think suleiman alayhi salam even when he sees the queen of sheba yeah. i can't use the word rattled because i can't disrespect the prophet of god like that but a prophet of God is just like any other person, you know, sending gifts, bribes. What's happening over here? You yes. know, what's she trying to do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, who is this person that the hood hood has come late? Mm -hmm. You know, the hood hood, the hoopo bird is hoopo meant to come to me on time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to establish <laughs> a just system over here, but this hoopo bird is not here. Where are you? And the hoopo bird, you know, Suleiman's story is this really mystical story where the, the, birds. the birds and the jinn and everyone's, yes. you know, speaking in unison and... And the hoopo bird is amazed by the way this woman runs her, her state. And then the way she conducts herself with such class. You know, Nabi Sulaiman is a daunting figure because prophet, king, mm -hmm. unbelievable kingdom, son of David. Yeah. You know, it's still it's religions who fight over him, you know. <laughs> and so you got this lady who the Quran wants to make sure is mentioned. Whether it's in Surah 27, whether it's in Surah 34, the Quran is stressing that she has to be mentioned. Given her due respect, as you Given were, her due respect. Yeah. And, sat, and I think that sometimes in our communities, the first place people go to is Mary, mother of mm -hmm. Christ. Yes. But if you're looking for somebody who is actually running the show with such class, you know, there's panache about yeah. her. Yeah. Yeah. Like a queen. And one of the best yeah. ways in which I believe that she shows her class, when she sees her throne, next to Suleiman, and they ask her, is that your throne? And she's like, it looks like it's my yes. throne. Yeah, yeah. It, it, this really clark, because they never admit. Yeah, there's a sense of uh, almost female decorum. Yeah. yeah, but when you're looking within Shia tradition, I don't think there's much about this lady. You know, you may have the tafasir, which talk about the story, that's there, mm -hmm. but building a paradigm from the Queen of Sheba, Belqis. Yes. So you've got that there, then, Generally, within the Quran, you've got snippets of references, sure. you know, to, to certain women and their positions. We mentioned Mary, Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh. Asiya, Hajar, uh, but I just feel that with Asiya, Hajar and so on, you've got this spiritual element, which yeah. I think many have come to the idea that, yes, you know what, spiritually, our mothers are so devoted to Allah. They hold majalis and so mm -hmm, on. Mm -hmm. But with the Queen of Sheba, you've got this thing where it's like, Hold on, that paradigm that you always build, that God views woman as you must have babies, you're emotional, you can't lead men. No, actually, I'm going to I'm going to tell you the story of when her and Suleiman interacted. Yeah, yeah. So if you're looking there, I think something can be built there which really hasn't been built. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, you gave a brilliant example there. Perhaps, perhaps, just a, an opinion here. She was perhaps the um, early you know, day sort of equivalent, maybe not equivalent, but very similar to maybe Khadija as a businesswoman, outgoing, you know, and looking to expand as yeah. it were, you know, not in a, in a bad way or anything, yeah, yeah. or in a feminist way. So perhaps, as you mentioned, you know, we should be talking about these notable figures and, and really strive to take what examples we can take. I think take you're right. I think what you see with Sayyidah Khadija yeah. and with, for example, another wife of the Prophet, such as Aisha, mm -hmm. you've got two women who take the helm amongst the men of their time. Right. One emerges 
with unbelievable um, success where, you know, they're calling her the pure one, you know, the princess of Quraysh, very highly revered. And you've got another one who many are absolutely baffled until today by her behavior <laughs> at the battle of the camel. Yeah. But no one can reach a conclusion because of how Aisha behaved at the battle of the camel that that means that all you women look at you, you're all emotional. Look at Aisha at the battle of the camel. She leads thousands of men to kill each other. Muslims, you know, absolutely butchering each other. Mm -hmm. um, 25 years after the Prophet Muhammad died. Quite ridiculous, in fact, yes. that 25 years after your Prophet dies, you're ready to actually fight his family. But that's for another discussion. But what you have here is, I find it quite unbelievable that there are certain uh, academic scholars out there who are like, look at Aisha. Look at her leadership qualities. I I'm not going to go that far and say because a lady led men in a battle, that means that this is the proof for why ladies have to be given leadership positions because that was an absolute calamity what happened there, you know. Uh, but with Sayyidah Khadija, no, that's, that's, that's beautiful. Yes. Um, naturally, there's a class difference. You can't discuss both in the same, no, no. In the same weight. But with Sayyidah Khadija, السلام, what you have is that you've got this, you know, real... Calmness, mm, mm, mm. knowing how to talk to which man, who to employ to talk to who. Yes. So now we uh, will be looking at probably the next question or next part of the discussion in terms of innovations. But just before we do, I think we have a caller. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, the caller is disconnected. So um, just reverting back to now to this brilliant um, discussion today. Um, do you think so, you know, that there is a lack of narrators, first and foremost, and a, and a lack of narrations, and also leading up from that, um, a lack of credence given to women? I think certainly within Shia, um, within Shia tradition, especially if you're looking at books on the narrators, yeah. you'd be hard pressed to find Handful, maybe? Yeah, you'll be hard-pressed to even find biographies about them. Okay, let's say there's some names of female narrators, but a biography is very hard to come by. Now, there may be different reasons that can be postulated why we don't have that many female narrators. Mm -hmm. One opinion may be that these female narrators, there was a, more of a focus from them on, for example, legal and Quranic discussion. Right. Whereas when you're looking at the idea of how many hadiths they narrated, mm -hmm. there wasn't so much of a discussion in terms of them being hadith narrators. Right. There were discussions of theirs on law, for example, okay. discussions on tafsir. Yep. But it's not like, for example, like how maybe with other schools in Islam where there's such a focus on a hadith orientated worldview that you're going to have much more of a, of a social milieu at the time where being a hadith narrator is a huge thing. Okay. What you have within the Shi'i community in that early period is that possibly a lot of these women were more discussing legal and Quranic okay. issues amongst their okay. uh, contemporaries. Then you have a second opinion which may be that hiding their names was vital for their survival. Okay. If you come out with their names publicly, uh -huh. you know there was a period where the Shia could not come out with the names of some of their men publicly. But just on that point, do you not also think, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm. in terms of a hadith, I think there are numerous traditions from the Islam and the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, that say, and this is this, by the way, as a stereotype, goes through all the schools of thought, I think, okay? that the best place for a lady is to be hidden and hidden from a man and be at home and so on and so forth. Do you think that has been taken advantage of as well? Just that, just traditions like that. Well, yeah, I, th I think there's definitely... And therefore, therefore, yeah. that, well, you're not going to hear from them. Yeah. Oh, I think certain cultures, you know, not even abused it, destroyed it. You know, there are certain cultures 
there were daughters who weren't allowed to go study at college. Yeah. And whether they lived in uh, the US or they lived in London or they lived in parts of Iraq, for example, okay. or parts of Pakistan Pakistan's and India, India, they would use certain traditions about women where they would blatantly say that, you know what, um, this is the hadith and therefore you cannot go to study because no man should ever see you. And therefore a woman's potential isn't being fulfilled. Or, to, to a degree. Yeah, or therefore the woman is seen as being the cause of all this sexual deviancy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That the man is not to blame. It's the woman who's to blame for the sexual deviancy. Yeah. And therefore what better thing to do than make sure that these women actually get married early um, and, you know, rear the children, uh, upbringing, and then they've done their holy struggle, right? Uh, if you want to yes, call it yes, that. Yes. Um, and as I said, there are other traditions as well, which that particular man, and, and let's not generalize as well. There are also fathers out there who looked at some of the great Shi'i women. Mm -hmm. Now, we may say that we don't have many names in terms of the biographies. Yes. But we can't deny that if you take Fatima Zahra out of the paradigm, considering we see her as infallible and so on, people may say, well, we can't relate to that. Okay. We look at Sayyidah Zainab salam in terms of the importance of gaining knowledge, yeah. the importance of dissemination of knowledge. You look at, for example, Fidda, the servant of Fatima Zahra, who for the so last nice. 20 years of her life only used to speak the Quran. Quran. Every verse she used to recite was the Quran. Yeah. Then you look, for example, let's go a bit later. Let's not name necessarily um, only those who are related to Ahl al kisa Ahl or Ashab al kisa mm -hmm. Let's go a bit later. Hamida, the yes. wife of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Imam al-Sadiq gives immense praise for his wife Hamida. She's not from the Ahl al-Bayt. Mm -hmm. Not Bani Hashim. No, no. But she's the wife of an Imam, but he is so... Honored to tell the people that if you want to gain knowledge, go to my wife, Hamida, for example. Sure. Say that we have another call. Asalaamu Alaikum. Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum. Asalaamu Alaikum. Sister, yes. Uh, question, um, please. I'm Fatima from London. Um, okay. I've been watching your show uh, for some time and I actually really like the topic. And I wanted to ask the Sayyid a question. Um, I wanted to ask why are men and women not allowed to mix in mosques? And okay. what his opinion is about that. Integration of men and women in mosques. Yeah, this is culture, and this really may come from the world view of the resident alim of the mosque. Okay. If the people in that mosque are observing hijab, mm -hmm. then there should be no harm in holding programs, lectures, seminars where the men and the women are in the same hall. Okay. Now, discretion of the scholar of the mosque may be that he says, that we should seek to prevent any situation where there may be, for example, uh, flirtatious behavior. Let's be something frank. along those lines. Yeah. There might be flirtatious behavior, too much <coughs> mixing or interaction. But in this day and age, you want to get close to someone from the mosque. You go to Instagram, yeah. Snapchat, Twitter. I tell you, in my day when we were growing up in London. If you manage to speak to someone on MSN, you found it as an amazing success. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, MSN remember, Messenger. That's right, yeah. I think in your day, you, <laughs> you guys were just before MSN Messenger. But we used to find it amazing that we could get mm, on MSN mm. and we've got, or I should say maybe others have got um, a girl's email address or something. Um, and now you're able to get it. But the Mawlana of that mosque may see that. But once again, there's this... Always this fear that's there, that you know what, because the women are in the hall with the men, yeah. that means they're going to be the cause of the sexual deviancy that occurs. If we're observing hijab, us men, yes, like we always stress to the woman to observe hijab. Sure, sure, lower then gaze I, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and we know that when it first begun, the verses, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ, for example, يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارَهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُ فُرُوجَهُمْ Tell the believing men to lower from their gaze. Mm -hmm. Then after that, it would say, So, this is more culture than it is religion. You go to the grand scholars, you sit with them, for example, if you sit with Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah lengthen his life, sure. he'll have men and women sitting, <coughs> sitting in the there. same room, yeah. Yeah. without a partition, answering their questions. Right, yep. right. Alhamdulillah, thank you for that. So thank then you. we had, as we were continuing, we were saying yeah. that Hamida, 
Mm. Wife of Imam al Sadiq. Sadiq alayhi salam, yeah. Okay, going back to the Ahlul Bayt ladies. You've got the lady who we're honoring in these nights, and many honor in Qum, mm -hmm. because some may have the opinion that it's in these nights that she was, um, she had passed away, and, and that is maybe Fatima al Masuma. And here you've got a lady who is known for her ilm, narrator mm. of Hadith al Manzila, Ali is to me like Aaron was to Moses, yeah. except that there is no prophet after me. Or narrator of the sermon of Ghadir, narrator of so many of the merits of Ahlul Bayt. Okay, these are all examples of people who are close or in and around the Ahlul Bayt circle. Okay. Then you've got ladies who I still think we're able to build real lessons from, who were ladies of great respect who can still be mentioned. And you can write literature and biographies on them. In my opinion, Sumayya, mother of Ammar bin Yasin, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the first martyr in Islam. Sure, sure. Asma bint Umais. Then you've got, for example, even Yazid's wife, who speaks out against Yazid mm -hmm. and what they had done to Imam Hussein al Hussein. Yeah. Then you've got, for example, people like uh, the daughter of Rashid al Hajari. Right. You know, so you've got people who are not necessarily from the Ahl al Bayt's family, but they are good people. Not just good, they left a legacy behind. Right. Rashid al Hajari's daughter. At the time when the Umayyads were rampaging and destroying people's lives, stood up against them. Sumayya stood up against the Quraysh. Yeah. So we've got that there. The question then is that on this area in particular of knowledge. Knowledge. You know, we tell a lot of the women that, yeah, yeah you should do these circles where you do Quran, Tafsir, for example. Mm -hmm. And in the Quran Tafsir class, gather together and hold your majalis and so on. Yeah. I don't think that is the highest level that they can reach. And mm -hmm. I think if you're looking at Shi'i history, there are certain ladies in Shi'i history, past and present. Okay. I'm talking post-occultation, who are phenomenal in their knowledge. If you're looking at, for example, Fatima Sitt al Mashayikh, the daughter of Shaheed al Awwal. Okay. Yeah, I think Shaheed al Awwal, many in Qum and Najaf will study the work in mm. Num al Damashqiyah, the Damascan glittering. His daughter and his wife, for that matter, I think she was called Um Ali, these were phenomenal scholars. These weren't just the daughter of a scholar or the wife of a scholar. No, these were people who were immersed in the study of religion and the sciences of religion. You've got also, for example, Sheikh al-Baha'i's wife. Mm. You've got a lady, if I remember rightly, and I hope I don't get her name wrong, Hamida Arwadashtiya, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And even her daughter as well. She had written a tafsir of the istibsar of Sheikh al tusi No one mentions these. These are colossal figures. But because in our mosques, we dumb down a lot of our women, too emotional, or a lot mm -hmm. of our women, you know mm -hmm. what, um, your main role is, okay, but also show them sure. that if they are going out to seek knowledge, they can reach the highest levels of knowledge with the blessings of God. When a lady writes the tafsir of the istibsar of Tusi, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, 40% of the Shia out there don't know the istibsar of Tusi. And I myself. guarantee you that maybe 80% have never read a chapter of the istibsar of Tusi. I guarantee you. Take it from me. We'll come to that in a moment, Sayyidna. There's a question on via WhatsApp. Um, Mariam from Chicago. I love watching your shows. I have a question for the Sayyid. It's a very good question, actually. Yep. Why are men allowed to give a lecture, majlis, in front of everyone, but women are not allowed? Comma, can women give majlis lectures in front of men? Of course they can. Hmm. Again, cultural, I'm presuming. You see, if I'm going to university, I don't care if the professors are male or a female. No, I sure. want to gain knowledge. You, you want to gain knowledge, yeah. Our culture 
has given that stereotype that is frowned upon. Yes. Now, people will say, well, Zainab السلام, was forced to give that sermon in front of Yazid. Um Kulthum wasn't. She stood up and gave one. Sakina bint al Hussein wasn't. She stood up and gave one. Yes. Fatima al Zahra السلام, upon the confiscation of FedEx stood up with a group of ladies to go and insist on speaking. Now, okay, mm -hmm. someone might say, well, there's a barrier around her and she created a barrier, yeah. but she created a legacy. You don't oh, need to remain silent. And number two, your knowledge can be destroying those men who are around mm. you. If I now hear that there is a lecture to be given by the woman, my, woman in my community, and it's very interesting, you know, when you come to our mosques, you'll notice that if a woman does go up to speak at a, let's say a fundraising event. Right. You know, these fundraising events, very difficult to speak already. I don't care which speaker you are. Why? Because they always tend to have this habit of putting food on people's table the moment you're speaking. So you've already got knives and forks. Going, <laughs> and you're trying to concentrate, which no one ever appreciates. And more interesting than all of that is when you've got, when you've got a woman speaking up there and you've got men literally on the front table with their back to the woman. So instead of turning their chair mm. around, I'm sure you've seen this in weddings. Very good point. In weddings, you'll have a Maulana who'll go up to speak. There's Maulanas on the table in front. They don't turn around. No. They're facing the audience. But akhlaq and Shiism will leave for another day. That needs major readdressing in terms of little bits of akhlaq. Because right. I think we're mastering law and theology, but we've forgotten akhlaq. Yeah. And a lot of those who mastered law and theology in some cases... Um, Never were known for akhlaq. Now, when you're coming here to this lady, this lady is giving a speech. You'll still have the Maulana sitting on his table. Maulana, is it that difficult for you, Maulana, to turn around? Can turn I turn around. around? Can I actually turn around? I don't think I can turn around because <laughs> my mic is, is attached. But it's so difficult for that Maulana mm -hmm. to, at that moment, just simply turn their chair and look at that lady. Why? Why, Maulana? For what reason can you not turn around and have a look at that lady? What reason? That's a human being, number one. That's a person who's worked their socks off to gain knowledge. Traveled far and wide to gain knowledge. Maybe in some cases will give you something to learn. Yeah. And I always say, when you go to approach any lecture, 70% is your attitude, 30% is your intellect. Mm. If you go with a good attitude to a lecture, you'll learn something. Yeah. And these people will keep their back facing that person and I find it disgraceful. And that's the arrogance that then permeates into their sons and sons and sons. There are some mosques that have worked hard okay. in recognition of these examples we gave. Yeah. Sheikh al-Baha'i's wife, um, Hamida who wrote the tafsir of the istibsar, um, you know, Shahid al-Awwal's wife and daughter, I'll give you another example. If I'm not mistaken, Muhammad Taqi al Majlisi, you know, Muhammad Taqi al Majlisi and Muhammad Baqir al Majlisi. Mm -hmm. So, Muhammad Baqir al Majlisi always associated with Bihar al Anwar. Bihar Muhammad Taqi al Majlisi's daughter, I think her name was Amina, married Al Mazandarani. Okay. Famous scholar. Yep. She That's would, in some cases, answer questions on his behalf. SubhanAllah. He, you know, Mazandarani is huge. Yeah. Her dad, Muhammad Taqi. But she, so there are some mosques I have to give credit to. They mm -hmm. will always make an effort to say that men or women, we can gain knowledge from both. They'll invite both. But there are others until today. I don't know who's going to change that mindset. Yeah, so it now has wonderful um, insights. Um, viewers, we will be just going for a short break. Um, see you very soon, inshallah. Asalaamu As Alaikum. <laughs> and welcome back to tonight's live show on Imam Hussain TV where we're looking at the image or the images of women in Shi tradition. Sayyidina, as-salamu alaykum. Alaykum as-salamu um, 
fascinating insight into tonight's um, show, I think. Um, I just want to fast forward a little bit because there's a lot of content, hopefully, inshallah, we can inshallah. discuss and share with our viewers and hopefully um, sisters. Um, the, the point of ijtihad or malja, as it were, reaching a level whereby you can actually dissect and provide levels of jurisprudence because obviously it's totally, totally, um, the moja system is totally male oriented. Not to say that there aren't ladies who possess that knowledge, but do you think there's a change or reformation involved? What are the countering arguments? What, if we claim to be dynamic, what what's required? What's required now? What? Because this is a quite a. I think a it's. Um, I think it's culture. Again, culture. That stops a woman in Shia tradition from being a marja taqlid. Right. But there's no law, as it were, from the Ayam Amasumin to say that... Let's look at, let's for example look at someone, you know, if you look at someone like Ayatollah al khoi may Allah bless his soul, grand jurist, yeah, you know, yeah. phenomenal personality. Sheikh Muhammad Mahdi Shamsuddin was one of his students mm -hmm. from Lebanon. I think he died in 2001. Another great scholar. Okay, okay. And they have an interesting discussion on mm -hmm. this area. Mm -hmm. Just a bit, uh, just to pause here, I don't mean to be rude. We have another sure. caller and then we'll come back okay. immediately. So, no. Salaam alaikum. First of all, uh, Salaam alaikum. Very honored, very honored to see Mr. Amar Nakshwani. I learned so much from him. Salaam alaikum. I don't listen I think to it's him. a bit too. Uh, and, and you know. Call is uh, gone, so sorry, uh, Sayyidna. Um, just in terms of uh, Aydala Said Khoi's student, um, yeah, passed Aydala away Aydala in 2001, Khoi you mentioned, yeah. And his student, Sheikh Muhammad Mahdi Shamsuddin, mm -hmm. renowned Lebanese scholar of... Um, some repute. Some repute, and someone who had studied in Najaf uh, for a great deal of his life. And there's a great back and forth on this area. If I go to a doctor, I don't care if they're a male consultant or a female mm. consultant. Mm. I just want the prescription, the remedy, and sure. what have you. Absolutely. If I go to a lawyer, if the best lawyer in, in the Western world is a female, a female, I don't really care. Yeah. If she's finished law school and she can win any case, that's my main concern. Mm. And so what you have is, the question is then posed, that if you're studying Islamic law, a man's going to study Islamic law in Qom, and a woman's going to study Islamic law in Qom. And both have to start off with the Muqaddamat, yeah. with the first stage, then Sutur, okay. then Bahad Kharaj. Right. And then at the Bahad Kharaj level, they may have written certain books on Tafsir, for example. Okay. Or they may have given certain Ijazas. Why is it that that Alim who has written on Usul, on Tafsir, given Ijazas, can still make it? to announcing his marja'iyah whereas that same contemporary of his <coughs> let's look for example someone like Nusrat Amin okay. renowned female mujtahida <coughs> no one ever says she was a marja say mujtahida okay she <laughs> reached the level of ijtihad she doesn't have to do taqlid of anyone why couldn't we do a taqlid of her? She has reached the level of ijtihad. Is it just because of her gender? And this lady, her daughter, her niece, all of it's a family of scholars. Um, and they made sure that they built an organization where ladies were able to study. Mm -hmm. And she has 15 volume tafsir of the Quran. And she's a contemporary of some of the most famous jurists in Qom. Okay. Who, and you're talking I, I, think, about, I think she was born in, if I'm not mistaken, 1886 yeah. and died in 1983. Right. All right. So you can imagine the names of some of the scholars in that mm. period. Yeah. Mm. They made it to being known as Marja Taqlid. Whereas with her, even though she's given ijazas, handed out ijazas to scholars. No. Why not? Some of the grand scholars said, 
that there are certain traditions from the Ahlul Bayt that indicate okay. that you should only go to men when you're dealing with legal issues. Right. So if there's a tradition, for example, from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam where he says, go to the Rajal of our community mm -hmm. when there's a problem between you. So they say, look, he says, go to Rajal, go to men. It seems like what the Imam is really saying is go to our Shia when there's a problem between you. Don't go to mm -hmm. non-Shia when resolving a dispute. Or some, for example, may cite a hadith like, don't put your affairs in the hands of a woman. Any nation that does that is going to be ruined. Right. Context, possibly about Kisra's daughter of Persia ruining the nation, not about Queen of Sheba or other women who done well with their nations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some might look at books like Nahj al -Balagha. And if they see a sermon, women are deficient in faith, deficient in intellect. You've seen that. Naqasat al-Uqul, famous sermon in Nahj al -Balagha. Women are deficient, women are deficient. Women are deficient. And they say, therefore, Ali ibn Abi Talib, is known as being a man who's a misogynist, he's, you know, really looks down at women. Mm -hmm. Nahj al balagha is not Imam Ali's book. Mm -hmm. You know, Nahj al balagha is the work of Sharif al radi mm -hmm. May Allah bless his soul. Right. The two great sure. brothers we had, a scholar Sharif al radi and Sharif al murtad So, Shams al-Din has an interesting, I think, back and forth <coughs> in looking at the fact that when you've got Nusrat Amin, who's passed away, may Allah bless her soul. Sure. Or you've got someone like Zuhra Safati, and you've got others in, in, in Iran, in Qom, ladies who have achieved brilliant levels. And yet we're adamant that, well, socially speaking, she is a woman. So yes, she's a, reached the level of Ijtihad, but she should stop there because after that, when you want to come and visit her, and they start bringing up all different reasons, you know, maybe emotional, maybe this or that. This person's worked their socks off mm -hmm. to study the greatest manuals of theology and law. Yes, yes. What's wrong if I want to follow her and emulate her? And I think you are seeing a shift. Okay. That there are a couple of scholars in Qom right. who have begun to give arguments as to why, for example, a woman should be allowed to announce herself as a marja. Okay, okay. Yeah. We have... Two or three questions now. Right? Sure, go ahead. I'll come back to that point <coughs> because I just wanted to um, come to uh, go to the point about um, you know the traditions yep. in terms of uh, or the validity, as it were, of who we should follow. I, as you mentioned, according to some, you know, it should be through men only. Sure, sure. But we'll come back to that. Let me just read out um, a couple of questions. Um, I'm Mariam Jabbar from Norway. The women of Ahlul Bayt showed great leadership on how they can be successful business women. Outspoken lectures, excellent housewives and mothers. We have great number of examples from the women of Ahlul Bayt on how all of these things can be achieved um, all, the time, all at the same time. But in this day and age, I don't <coughs> feel we are much respected as women in the community because we always have to sit at the back in the mosque. That's one point. Men always get the big, nice venue. We sit segregated in the mosque. But yet in real life, we work in a mixed environment, going back to the point you yeah, mentioned, yeah. Uh, from a mixed environment with women from different cultures. How can we change that and start to give leadership roles to the women in mosques, please? So that's the first point. Um, and the other one is, uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. What should be the role of a mother after her son gets married? That's quite key, actually. It sounds very basic. So what should be the role of a mother after her son gets married, but also the first question in terms of leadership, in terms of... Well, I say to Maryam, firstly, mm. um, you're, you're lucky you can stay at the back of the mosque. There are some ladies who for years were thrown in a basement where they were lucky the whole building didn't fall on them. You know, and that, uh, that sadly... Uh, what I would say is at the beginning that, okay, lack of space and so on. And there are some women who actually enjoy being on the ladies' side, away from the gents, because they believe mm -hmm. maybe if they want to be, for example taking their hijab off and sit comfortably with their kids and so on. But I think you'll find a lot of them will say, I want to be sitting face to face with the speaker so that I'm able to actually interact. Right. I think it's a big difference when you have eye contact with a speaker who's making a point rather than on a television screen. Mm -hmm. um, but I must admit that there are a lot of mosques now who are gradually recognizing the need for seminars where men and women are on the same mm -hmm. hall. Um, the need for a definitely on the first level a chairwoman and a chairman. Okay, good point. 
Yes. And inshallah, in the future, going towards a presidency of a mosque or a leadership of a mosque of a woman and a man. And I think there are a lot of <coughs> ladies in our communities who deserve a lot of respect mm. for okay. representing the Ahlul Bayt and their followers wonderfully in the world of social work, in the world of economic and political work. So hopefully the Western demographic can set a real um, example. example for those yeah. there. Okay, um, the questions are coming thick and fast. So the next one was, what should be the role of a mother after a son gets married? And then I'll read out another one subsequent to that. Uh, Salam, my name is Fatima Shakargi from Croydon. Question, Salam. I went to the Islamic event where the speaker asked women not to recite salwat louder than men because of the rules of hijab. Is this religion or culture? Uh, so the first one was the role of a mother after a son gets married, or maybe it's too generic, I'm not sure. Well, the role of a mother after the son gets married is always to be a backbone mm. for that couple, right. you know. Um, not just a son. Well, of course, not just her son. Yeah. And not to be a burden on the son where he has to mm. emotionally balance his love for his mom, for his love for mm. his wife. But rather to be someone who's a backbone for them. And many mothers you'll find. <clears throat> yeah emotionally try their hardest mm -hmm. to welcome the daughter-in-law mm -hmm. as their own daughter. Mm -hmm. And those who aren't, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open their hearts to be softer. Right. The next question was about uh, ladies reciting durud, uh, salwat loud or aloud as it were. So the speakers that don't do it? Uh, so louder than men because of the rules of hijab. So that's what the speaker I don't know. mentioned. Some people are is this also. religion or culture? I, if that's what really happened, then people are pedantic. I mean, mm. I mean, just, okay, so I'm absolutely bad. Yeah, Why you, you know, just get on with your content. If you've got content, just get on with it and let's hear the lecture. Okay, we have another two questions. Asalaamu As Alaikum, brothers. Hoping and praying you are both well. Got a question and hope respected Sayyid Amar can shed light on this topic. When I go to Pakistan to visit families and I speak to my cousins, and they mentioned that they have big dreams of doing well in life, such as becoming a doctor, engineer, etc., meaning a good career. But they are stopped by parents, according to them, if their daughters are too well educated. Now, this is definitely this prominent in the <coughs> Indo-Pak community. Perhaps not, not just here. Indo-Pak. Oh, okay, okay. Not just Indo-Pak. It okay. happens in uh, okay in the um, Iraqi community as well, Arab community generally. Yeah. Yeah, so I suppose no. well, he's posed the question, I believe this is all culture. How can this culture be broken? That families will allow their daughters, <laughs> who are bright in education and passionate about working, to be allowed to succeed from Ali Kazmi in London? Pakistan has got some of the most educated women I've ever come across. Mm. And has had a woman at the helm, which certain first world countries still haven't. Yeah. But at the same time, like any country, there are certain areas where culture overtakes religion, mm -hmm. where people are too extreme in the way they view things. Mm -hmm. The problem is, if the Mawlana from the Mimbar is saying to the ladies, don't do salawat loud, how do I expect the ones under the Mimbar to be God's gifts on earth for how to look after their daughters in their future? Yeah. Your daughter, she's going to get educated, Seeking knowledge is, of course, obligatory on every male and female. And we should have more confidence in our daughters as being great role models in the way the daughters of Ahlul Bayt were for them. Okay, two questions, and then hopefully we can go back to where we were discussing, because I think they're <coughs> coming in quite fast now. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Asbat Abdullah Adam <coughs> from Ghana, yeah. West Africa. I think our problem we have in Africa towards our women in Shiism, is the education, especially the Shiism teaching. I mean, holes are for women. Now, mm. I don't think he's explained himself that well. What I think he means is... Or she. Or she. Um, is, you know, are women in Shiism in the education, what can we do to promote it, possibly? So I'm, you know, I'm just really trying to put parts of the question together as it were it maybe I don't know if they'll enjoy when they go to study in Najaf or Qom right and what about Hoza <laughs> in that, Africa like if we stick to Najaf and Qom mm. I don't know if someone who's gone there to study Islam is really going to enjoy that environment it takes a certain type of person to enjoy tolerance tolerance culture is there 
tolerance and um, in terms of conditions not to be you know yeah I don't even look at the environment or the okay. number of beds in the room I'm, I'm not too focused on that stuff no in terms of facilities for example yeah I think you know facilities worldview the way a woman should be the lecturers imposing their worldview on you right I don't know I don't know how many of these things need to be reassessed, or I don't know if it's a particular type of character okay. who can fit into that. And I think some come out as great, and others come out losing their head. Right. Like any religious seminary. Okay. So I think in Ghana, for example, if they're able to have... There's many great scholars we know from Ghana. You know, our good friend Sheikh Noor, so Sheikh Jalil, and others. And um, if they can have some of those lead the Hausa in Ghana. Right. Shout out to all my, you know, friends in Ghana. I received so many well wishes from Ghana. Alhamdulillah. And hopefully one day we'll go. Inshallah. To Ghana. But, um, yeah, if you can start off your own seminary there, mm -hmm. there's no harm going to the Middle East to study. But I think if you know your culture, you know the context of your own legal system in comparison to Islamic law, Yes. No, maybe more fruitful discussions. Okay. Um, the last question, just for the moment, we'll take inshallah some more. Um, Salam Ranim Raza, the name. Can you elaborate on working women in hospital, like a female doctor, had to touch Nah Mahram for examination or diagnosis or dressing of a wound, for example? Also, also asking questions to Nah Mahram people and involving in conversation for the benefit of the patient. So I suppose what um, this person's asking is, is it Jaiz? Yeah, well, um, if Islam always says priority is to save one's life. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a moment where you're saving the life of the human being, there is no harm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, then in that situation, um, as a female doctor, you may want to reconsider who you're allowed to interact with. Right. In terms of, especially if it's going to come to touching and so on. Uh, but in terms of, you know, helping people's lives, saving people's lives, operating on people's lives, there's no issues there. Mm -hmm. I think even if you're going to go to the very conservative level, you know, you're wearing gloves. Yeah, yeah. You don't always have to interact with the patient in terms of physical interaction. Sure. Way, you know, um, and if you do, there may be machines in the way. There are mm. ways to reconsider these issues. Inshallah, we'll have a separate program for all the biomedical Okay, ethics, inshallah. And I'm sure uh, it goes without saying, you know, it's common sense about your knee your knee yeah. is to treat someone and not to, you know, do sure. something else. Mind you, with doctors, many have very sincere knees and sometimes some forget their oaths. Yeah, okay. Um, just going back to the point that you mentioned um, about 10 minutes ago, I suppose, was the, that um, when Alim perhaps um, shed light on um, that um, Jurisprudence should be taken or laws should be taken from men. Yes, if we can <coughs> probably just go back to that. Now, I just wanted to, just in terms of the research I was sort of conducting today, we mentioned, you mentioned actually, Bibi Hamida al Musaffa, the wife of Imam Jafar Sadiq al Islam. In fact, I came across a quite an interesting point today, which probably <coughs> counters um, one of the points about that it should only go to men in that um, it was actually her who actually introduced Bibi Najma to Imam Mutha al-Qadim al mm. uh, a pious wife. Yeah, well, that, that I think would be a mum helping out her son getting married mm. um, and certainly knowing who best was for her son. Right. Uh, but I do think that when you're looking at someone like Hamida mm -hmm. al-Barbari, uh, the wife of Imam al-Sadiq, is a phenomenal lady. Right. Forget the fact she's the wife. You know, we, we always stick on this idea, wife of, daughter of. They are great. Mm. You many times you hear people say, Father Zahra is great because she's the daughter of the Prophet. Yeah. And she's the wife of Imam Ali. Fatima is Fatima. <laughs> she's great. Yeah. yeah, that FedEx sermon is yeah. not enough yeah. right. for you to see the spectacular ilm of Fatima. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quran, hadith, theology, everything, spirituality in one sermon. Yes. I think likewise... But, you know, people, when they look at Fatima Zahra, because it's always Fatima, metaphysical, born from an apple, from Jannah, from Mi'raj. Okay, so they can't relate to her. So then let's go to those who we can relate to. I said, when you look at Shahid al-Awwal's wife, his daughter, Muhammad Taqi al-Majlisi's daughter, Sheikh al-Bahai's wife, 
Nusrat Amin, Zahra Safat, others. These are phenomenal scholars who have studied more Quran and law than anyone out there. Sure. Maybe we have to reconsider some of our arrogance in mm. the way that we mm. look at the other genders, where we're like, Islam's a religion of uh, rights to women, Islam's a religion of rights to women, Islam's a... But sometimes we're the first to say, but you guys, you know you're emotional, you're just meant to bring babies and you just yeah. stick there. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, now, just let's move on to after specifically the period of the 11 holy Imams. Naturally, you have Imam Wali al Asa, Imam Mahdi al Islam in Ghaiba at the moment. What has happened from that period, so probably 11, 11 50 years back, to now? <coughs> We've talked about the system which is unique to the Shayu school of thought in terms of the Moja system and that there's a need to follow a Moja, i.e. Wajib as it were. But what has happened to the women? Is it just literally collapsed if I'm gonna until be we fast forwarded up to, for example, yeah. only people that I've known and, and I'm as jahil as I am, you know, just people, for example, like Shahida bint al Huda. Yeah. What's happened in between that gap? Sure. Well, if we're going to be frank, Muhammad, we have to admit that God in his worldview mentions lots of men in the Quran. Right. Now, he's decided that all his prophets are men. Hmm. And that's always the argument back that, look, God had 124,000 messengers. They were all men. Yes. And yes, you can always mention Mary and Fatima. But, you know, when you come into the greatest woman, they're four. They're Mary, Fatima, Khadija, and Asi, and after that. And maybe that was the mindset of society rather than how God necessarily wanted to set a particular um, barometer. Yeah. That the mindset of society was that the woman isn't meant to be at the helm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think when you're looking in the period of the Ghaiba, gradually you're seeing that even these names that I mentioned, because there's someone more known than them in the public sphere, nice. they don't get the plaudits. Okay. The world that we live in today it don't take you a long time to get to Gharib al Ghuraba in Mashhad. Mm. You could Skype Mashhad. Yeah. yeah. Maybe now you're going to see more of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Female scholarship comes to the fore. So now we have a call online. Salaamu Alaikum. Alaikum. Hello. Hello. Alaikum Salaam. Alaikum Salaam. Yes. Your call. Uh, uh, my question, I have a two-part question actually. Uh, my first question is, uh, I, I, I'm from Edmonton and recently Maulana here read uh, that Bibi Zainab's Rida was, uh, was never snatched from her after Shabir Ashu, which was never happened. And my second question is, um, my wife is a housewife and is there any recommendations, books, which she could learn Islam at home rather than going outside because she doesn't really have the time with the kids and everything? Okay, so I think the first question was about the snatching away of the... the yeah, the snatching away of the veil of Sayyidah Zainab. Yeah, the yeah. face veil was snatched away. Yeah, not the full... No, no, not the veil on the okay. head, the and face veil. And the second part was... And I could back it up with so much no, evidence, no, no, but I don't want to go into it now. Sure. Because mm -hmm. just in case someone says, well, you said that, I can back it up with about five hours of evidence. Yeah, and uh, I think the second uh, part of the question from the brother from Edmonton, Canada, I think it was from, uh, or is from, um, just inquired about um, perhaps what sort of education uh, his, uh, you know, his wife can be given, as it were, being a housewife as well, you know, being away from Hosea, which is which is a good point actually, you know, because we're living in those days and times where, let's be honest, we're either lazy or, you know, we're just giving that notion that we've got to do this, we've got to do that, and therefore... You've got, for example, people like, um, you're in Edmonton, and if I'm not mistaken, you would have come across the name of, if not, maybe you can look online, um, Sheikh Hassanen Qasim Ali. Okay. And Sheikh Hassanen, who resides currently in mm -hmm. Toronto. Okay. Um, has online courses right. uh, for people to study every subject you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Fantastic service that he's offering. Right. Um, and if you want, I could give the details. If you if they send a, a message to the 
WhatsApp Imam Hussain TV team. Inshallah. We can send the details. But Sheikh Hassanin Qasim Ali in Toronto for the general Canadian areas doing excellent online courses for anyone who wants to study. Yeah. Okay, so the WhatsApp number once again is 07939-917163. Um, so now we have two quick questions yeah. and then we'll go to this point, which is quite important actually, to actually to reanalyze, re as it were, the fiqh or jurisprudence mm. versus the principles of uh, jurisprudence. So if we just keep that in mind for the moment, hopefully if you can possibly just answer very uh, quick questions. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum, most Shia women do not wear a scarf in Europe. Why? What do you think about that? That's the first thing. Um, Alia Rusmi Ninx Ruslan, I'm not sure where um, she is from. Salam, I work as a carer looking after older geriatric, geriatric people. Sometimes I have to bathe and dress older men who are residents. What is the law on this? I do wear gloves. So I think you've already touched on Yeah, that's that. we have our show coming up in yeah. terms of the interaction sure. physically on these medical yeah. issues. We'll come to that soon. Sure. So those two questions. Yeah. So uh, in terms of the first one, people mm. not wearing hijab. I, I you know, I think there's a lot of Shia women out there, Muslim yeah. women who wear and don't wear. Mm. They're on their personal journey and Allah exactly. will judge them. Exactly. Inshallah. Inshallah. Yeah. So now going back to the point about uh, an analysis or reanalyzing fiqh or jurisprudence versus the principles of jurisprudence yeah. in relation to women. Yeah. What, how does that, um, you know, wh what should be well, I think the first, noted? It's interesting, you mentioned, you know, usul al-fiqh versus fiqh and, mm -hmm. and the principles of jurisprudence versus jurisprudence. And ultimately fiqh is our, you know, human understanding of what could be God's law. Mm. That means there's going to be a human element to the way we see the world. There's going to be a cultural element to the way we see things. Okay. There's going to be hadiths. We don't use them to guide people. We use them to sometimes back up our own world. Okay. And that's the problem which I feel has to be reassessed. Right. If I grew up in a house where the girls wore hijab like this, I'm going to look for those traditions that back up the way dad said our wives or our daughters should wear hijab. Okay. Even though what hijab is socially, physically, it's open to discussion, what was happening in Medina at the time, who was being affected by the hijab, what were the ladies wearing, what was the climate. These are all things that have to be introduced into the usul al-fiqh discussions. Text and context. What is absolute, what's mm -hmm. relative? Mm -hmm. Where is there scope for reform on certain issues or not? Yeah. Um, even a lot more of a Quranic worldview where we bring in more verses of the Holy Quran and the way that we're looking at these issues. Mm -hmm. And also reevaluating the traditions that we're taking, in which context were they said, was there scope for change or re-evaluation of them? Right. Inshallah, in future discussions. Inshallah, we'll inshallah. Them. I think we've just got a few minutes, so I'm just going to quickly rush a few questions to you now. This is, I think, quite important, and I don't think the questions come through. So. Um, hopefully, inshallah, you can shed some light on this. I personally think, what should she women do? Who should they look up to? Who can they go to these days? Um, you know, where can they get personal guidance from? And that doesn't mean the obvious, such as marriage, divorce, but in terms of practical living, um, you know, I think what, what we're what, seeing, what, 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 yeah. do they need clubs? Do they need uh, their <laughs> own centers? Do they need sort of you know, interactive offices, how can they develop themselves? If you're looking at London as an example, mm. there is a generation of Shia women, I would say, between, you know, mid-20s to mid-40s, who I think are yearning for a central base for them and their family to meet on a regular basis and remember the best days of the Ahlul Bayt and the saddest days of the Ahlul Bayt. So many centers, but I think you've got this really no man's land generation, neither wholly focused on the Arabic, nor necessarily only on the English, having to always protect the interests of their mums wherever they go, but mm. also wanting to have a community for their generation and their thought process and their interests. And I think this is a critical period now where they have to step up I think the men have to also be involved in all of this. That's not about having seven, eight mosques 
or others having about uh, or having a place where that whole generation that mainly were born in the 80s are able to congregate with their young kids mm. Mm. in the way I think the Khawaja community has done so yeah, well, for like example. That. Just be Firm, honest. rigid structure. Absolutely. Um, I, I like initiatives like Camp UK. Okay. okay. I like initiatives like Hassan Rajab Ali's camps that he does in the summer. Right. Where he's w welcoming brothers, sisters, parents, everyone to come and really interact with one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I like these initiatives because ladies are learning from the ladies and gents. Gents are learning from the ladies and gents. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a real interaction, that generation, but that's only for a couple of weeks. That's right, yeah, yeah. We need that going throughout the Pretty, whole yeah, year. Yeah, that cohesion, and, that interaction. And th those excuses that, you know what, it's not really there. You know, it's a shame that, for example, Imam al-Askari's uh, shahadas on Friday and you'll have you know, certain ladies brought up in London in their late 20s and their late 30s who may not go to any center mm. with their sons or daughters to learn about Imam al-Askari, who's the father of the man they revere the most. Yeah, absolutely. Well, inshallah, absolutely. we'll work towards rebuilding that. Okay, okay. alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, so, in terms of the... I mean, I can say really... Um, what I'm looking to sort of probably sort of pose right at the end is the stop and starts that have taken place. We've, t we've spoken about um, cultural differences, but do you also think, uh, certainly from, well, during the time of the Ahl Holy Ahlul Bayt al-Islam, to possibly, you know, the sort of last 800 years, the Munafiqeen, um, Bani Abbasis, Bani Umayya, have yep. played a, a detrimental impact in hiding um, narrations, narrators. Female Naturally, narrators, you mean? Yeah. Men and female. Men and women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think on the first level. That has, that has really. Um, I think on the first level, from the time of Muhammad Sadiq until the time of Muhammad Al Askari, mm -hmm. there were some really really sad periods for the Talibid or the Alid line okay. especially the females in some cases in the period of Mutawakkil having to share one piece of cloth between ten ladies um, so even if you wanted to go out there and gain more knowledge or disseminate that knowledge mm -hmm. you were already facing very difficult times right. and then if there were any great ladies of that period a lot of these narrators will not mention them or if they mention them a line or two maximum about them but that, I think, mainly applies to the men. I think the woman in that period of the Ahl al-Bayt and of the Shia al bayt there was a great amount of taqiyya. Okay, yeah. And I find it interesting when people... I remember someone was telling me that people were saying, uh, you Shia, taqiyya, taqiyya. Hey, buddy, <laughs> did you ever think why we do taqiyya? It's because of the viciousness of animals like yourselves killing anyone who mm. opposed you that we had to conceal our faith. Otherwise, if Islam was in a healthy position after the Prophet Muhammad passed away, a group wouldn't have to conceal their faith. Islam, the religion of peace. How interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, inshallah, we'll discuss. Inshallah. We've yeah. got just, uh, I think, two or three minutes. So uh, um, just a, a note of thanks, as it were, from one brother, Imran Shah. He's uh, really enjoying and he wants to give his salams to you. Wa alaykum as -salam. Um, He said that, you know, um, um, how can we bring up our kids, especially daughters, according to Sayyidah Fatima Zahra Salaam Salaam and respected ladies of Ahlul Bayt. So that's one thing. He wants to say that you are an inspiration. Thank you. And so that's one part. And finally, um, possibly talking about um, any role models in this current period, Sayyidah, that you can possibly mention uh, the women. mums, the mums who are... But also, uh, perhaps female scholars? Well, like I mentioned earlier, I think... You, said, you mentioned Nusrat Amin, but Yeah, any, Nusrat Amin, Zohra Safati, for example. And now? Um, are... Well, I think there's a, there's a number out there who are really working within the field okay. of, um, of Islamic seminaries, of academia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Many go unnoticed. They're doing great work. They will continue to do great work. But maybe we need to give more of a chance for them to come to the limelight. Yeah, yeah. But I, there are so many we can name, and it does, doesn't have to be someone with a great amount of knowledge. Right. 
the mothers of the generation mm -hmm. that is generation x and the one before it mm -hmm. who were migrants refugees whatever who came here mm -hmm. the way they brought up their sons and daughters a lot of them deserve a lot of respect um and they all should be proud because it's a great generation okay viewers we've um finished now with our time is up from dr sayed amar nakshwani and myself salam alaikum and inshallah we will see you again next week inshallah. Yeah, yeah, yeah.